<laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Um, I, some of my students are here, and that's just voluntary, which is amazing. So, um, so I, I, um, I want to thank Tim for actually putting these together. I, um, you know, you get, you get used to kind of doing the same thing over and over again, and you, um, and I think it's neat to actually have something to talk about that I'm, I'm not a CRISPR scientist. I, um, I will tell you a little bit about what I do, but it, um, reading about it over the last past year and doing honors projects with students um, has really like, given me an opportunity to just kind of expand uh, my mind, which, um, you know, without people like Tim pushing us constantly, like, almost annoyingly. Um, uh, even I, when I was sitting up here, he's trying to get another talk next year. So, um, but, uh, but anyways, I, I think it's good. I think it's good for all of us to be thinking about new things. So um, first of all, why am I interested in this topic? Um, well, in, when I was in graduate school, one of the things I worked on was I did work on DNA arrays uh, for different organisms, and I w looked at recognition for DNA. And one of the things that we'll talk about today with CRISPR is that one of the things that makes it unique is it identifies unique sequences of DNA. And so I have a past background of doing amplification and recognition of big biomolecules and then trying to analyze them. Uh, in the gas phase. So we were doing more diagnostic components with DNA. Um, I've worked a little bit with some students out at Hope uh, and, and faculty out at Hope looking at m doing mutations in genes and seeing how those um, ultimately affect uh, an organism, and so protein modifications. And then I have a couple students here that did honors projects in reading this book. Um, we f I found this a couple years ago. It's a crack in creation, and I know a few of you have read this, and it is about um, the scientist uh, Jennifer Daubna out at Berkeley that helped develop this, mech this uh, tool. And she's an RNA chemist, and so it's not like she knows bacteria or different things. She looks at like structures of, of RNA molecules. So, um, and I just think it's kind of an interesting story. So if you, if you read um, what I wanted to get covered today, it was really looking at how this process came about and then talking about like what are some of the applications. And so I'll, I'll, you can ask me questions, you can comment at the end, maybe you know something I don't know, I hope, or you can say like, that was the most ridiculous thing, um, this is actually true. Um, so, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through this process. Um, and you, you this, is, this has been, um, showing up in our news over and over again, this concept of gene modification and CRISPR. And um, uh, some of the things that goes on when, in science is when a new technique is developed, there, there are patent disputes. And so you look at some of the high power researchers in CRISPR out at Berkeley or MIT, and they fight over the uses of these things. And it's because these have a strong diagnostic tools, that means money's gonna probably be made, and so modifications around this. So people are kind of vying for patents around this. So you see it in the news around patents. If you were at the end of the year last year, you might have seen that um, a scientist in China had, had a, a, a modified some embryos so that they were not, so they were HIV resistant. And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. That's a little bit controversial. Um, and then, like I said, when with patents come stocks, and you will, I know some people that have owned these, and it's an emotional roller coaster for if you own any stock around CRISPR because it goes up and down with FDA approvals. And so we'll talk about some of the limitations of it too, and I'm not gonna give you stock tips though, so. Um, but what I'd like, so the outline for my presentation is I am gonna give you a quick overview of biochemistry. And it's just so that when I talk about this system and I talk about nucleic acids or amino acids, you know what I'm, you, you can at least reference back to this. And if you do want a copy of this, I'm happy to send this to you because I know probably in your pastime that's what you want to review is this talk. Um, uh, but I, I will say that I, I have sat through many of these. My hope is that you take like one or two things home with you. I, I, um, and I'll try and be short because Everybody loves when these get out early and you get a cookie, it's great. So, um, so I am gonna talk a little bit about bacteria. I'm not a biologist, but a and bacteriophage. Um, a, little, a few definitions, because I think you get caught up in the terminology. 
adaptive immune system, I'll explain that when we get to it, and then what are some of these applications of this CRISPR-Cas9 system. And um, there, it's, it's fascinating, and I, I am going to talk about a lot of the limitations, too, uh, because I don't, I, I, it's like any drug delivery, getting it to cells is tricky, and so we'll, we'll chat about that. So you know if you've taken a general biology class or a chemistry class before that um, DNA, if you ask even a little kid what DNA is, they'll say it's what makes us up, right? Um, and we know that from ge a genetic perspective, DNA codes for genes, right? And those genes can be transcribed to RNA, which is a, a compound that can ultimately be used and translated into proteins, okay? And proteins are what carry oxygen around our blood, they break down hydrogen peroxide in our body, they, all the systems that you've learned around glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, they all have a component in them. So I'm going to talk about DNA and RNA and protein because they're all involved in this process, okay? Um, so nucleic acids, that's where we're going to start and we have to have some molecules up here because um, when you think of DNA, that's what you're used to, right? Seeing the double helix and this kind of two rungs of the DNA. But you know that it is made up of those four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And they pair up really specifically. And that's sort of the crux of this technique is something has to make sure that they pair up when DNA pairs up with each other. When we recognize DNA, it's because of those A's and T's and C's and G's, okay? Um, nucleic acids can be in the form of RNA as well, so DNA gets coded to RNA, and usually we think of this as single-stranded, um, but it's way more complex than that. The RNA folds up into protein, or excuse me, folds up into structures like this one right here, which certainly looks like it's paired up with one another. And it's why um, uh, Professor Doudna actually got involved in this, because there is a lot of RNA kind of super, that secondary type structure that's in it, okay? So nucleic acids, RNA, and DNA. And then when you think about proteins, and I'm going to stop with the biochemistry here in a minute, um, amino acid chains are proteins, so that DNA codes for RNA, which codes for a protein. And proteins are made up of these simple little amino acids, long chains of them. In fact, the, the Cas9 system, the gene editing tool that I'm going to talk about, actually has about a little over 1,300 of these. So 1,300 of these strung in a row. And so that gets, that gets untenable from a chemical perspective. It's hard to say, show you 13, you know, 100 times 10 or 130, 140,000 atoms. So we use cartoons, and you've probably seen those before, kind of those alpha helices and those sheets, those beta sheets. And the structures that I'm going to show you are going to be more like cartoons than they are going to be like, sadly, than, than, than like atoms strung together, okay? Um, again, it's why people love biology, and then they come to chemistry, and they see this, and they're like, can we do this again? Um, so, Here's a couple protein structures, and you know they're cartoons. They're cartoons of those alpha helices and those beta sheets. This is hemoglobin. It's kind of a low-resolution picture. This is a beautiful complex between a protein and a piece of DNA. And you can see the characteristic double helix right across the top and then the protein over it. And I'll come back to that structure again here. I'll actually come back to both of these. So. There's a, there's, so we know that we got, have our biomolecules, our big bio, biomolecules of RNA and DNA and proteins. But this story sort of begins with bacteria. And over 20 years ago, um, I thought this was an interesting statement about bacteria. It says they don't have easy lives, right? So we, we eat them and we, we break them down in our immune system. And I, I read that half the bacteria die every day, um, and every couple days. And I've talked to a few of you about that. I'm not sure it's true, but I like the idea of it, um, that, that they're under attack. The point isn't whether or not that's statistically correct, because some are growing faster and some are growing slower. The fact is, bacteria are under attack, right? They're at, under attack by, uh, by um, our guts as well as these viruses that exist just to break them apart and, and use them, really. So when you, you think of a, a virus, a bacteriophage, 
um, they land on the surface of a bacteria, and they kind of look like that cool land rover, right, right here. And here's a nice little structure of them. And they, if you know anything about a virus, they insert their DNA into that bacteria, and then they use it to make more of themselves, right? And then they lice open and take advantage of it. So you know that the cell fate, when a virus is on it, is going to be death, right? It's going to use it, it's going to burst it open and spew out a bunch of itself again. And so what has happened over years of evolution is it's developed a system to combat these things when they come into, onto their surface and inject their DNA. And that's where CRISPR comes in. What I like about this is it was over 20 years ago when it was first identified, this CRISPR system. And so I have, I'm going to use pool noodles to do this because it's a visual. And that's the only way I can really think about this system. And, and Tim's going to help me here in a minute. Um, but if you think about this as a piece of DNA, and it's a cartoon, obviously, here. But if you think of these as kind of genes and this little, these little segments where you can see there's purple and a color and purple and a color and a purple. And in science, you know that we look for patterns, right? And so back in 1987, it was identified that this pattern was here. But then it took 20 years to figure out that it is actually part of an adaptive immune system, OK? The adaptive immune system of this, um, these bacteria. And so um, we'll get into how this actually happens here. But when you think of CRISPR, I never, it's, I, I was a laser chemist, and I always forgot what laser stood for. You know, it was light amplification of stimulated emission of radiation. You could never, I never remember that. I never remember what CRISPR stands for. But the words clustered, right, close together, regularly means they're, they have a specific size associated with them, interspaced, um, short, not long, and that's relative. We'll, I'll show you that. And then a palindrome se se uh, sequence in, in biology and chemistry matters. So it's the same forwards and backwards. And what that does is it allows DNA or RNA to have a specific sequence. They'll like pair with themselves and make hairpin structures because of it. And I'll show you a few of those. And then repeats over and over and over again. And I hope someone at the end asks me, how many times does it repeat over and over again? Because I'm ready for that one. So, um, so we're going we're gonna to chat a little bit about what these are. So that's what CRISPR stands for. That basically is recognizing this pattern down here, this repeated repeat spacer, repeat spacer sequence. Okay. Now, um, when we talk about cast genes, so this is kind of a hybrid. This system that I'm going to talk about is a system hybrid between um, proteins and nucleic acids, so DNA. RNA and proteins. So something has to play the role of, a, of, a, of these genes, the proteins, everything when they interact with viral DNA or the DNA within the bacteria, um, it's usually a protein with it. So I'm going to play that role as a protein. I actually specifically wore um, Cas here so that you can see this, the Cas protein. I, I thought to myself this morning that I ruined a perfectly good t-shirt unless someone goes, because I'll wear it and someone will go, they added a C and forgot an S, you know, when, um, so, uh, but I'm going to, I'll be, whenever we're talking about proteins, I'm going to play that role. I'm going to be that, that amino acid chain. And these cast proteins do lots of different things. So they are nucleases, which means they cut up DNA. Um, they separate, because if you're going to deal with viral DNA that's coming in, you have to be able to separate it apart. And then they do other things like identify unique sequences as well. Okay? So whenever I'm holding the DNA, remember, I'm the, I'm the protein. Okay? So let's get into what this means. So I'm a, ta I'm a bacteria. Let's say the stage is the bacteria up here. And I'm going to be invaded by a particular virus. And Tim's going to be that virus. Um, he's going to be carrying the DNA in in here. And there are basically um, three fundamental stages of ba this bacterial adaptive immune system. So they're, they want to get ready so that when a virus attacks them, they know what they're going to do. They'd like to destroy that viral DNA before it actually takes over and destroys that, that bacteria. Okay? So the first stage of this adaptive immune system is actually taking a piece of this DNA out of this um, virus that's coming in. So Tim, if you'd come up. Um, 
what happens is when he bring oh he already did it yeah <laughs> so yeah. so when when it's and it happens there's a mechanism that's all you have to do I appreciate it. I'm gonna call oh. you back up for more <laughs> yeah <laughs> you did your job so I as a Cas protein inside of this bacteria um, I am like Cas one and two I'm gonna take this when it gets inserted into the bacteria through the cell membrane um, and I'm gonna look for the specific specific spot on this and no, you'll notice that I have this black line here I'll explain what it is when I recognize that I'm actually going to clip out a little piece of DNA from that viral DNA okay and then that obviously gets cut up and it's gone and I'm going to insert it on the end of my CRISPR array so remember this is the normal bacterial genes that code for like me, the Cas genes, the things that are involved in this system. And then you'll notice it's been exposed to a couple viruses, and you, if you don't mind holding those up, like those might be DNA from other viruses, like a red piece, a little turquoisey piece, and now this yellow piece that I'm gonna add to this, okay? So I've taken a piece of DNA from a virus and incorporated it into my own DNA. I'm a bacteria, all right? So now I have this CRISPR system that has, I've just added a new repeat to it. So it's got this, this uh, repeated pattern, a spacer, that's what type of DNA now? Viral. viral DNA, these different viral DNA. I've, I've actually incorporated, it, or incorporated into my own DNA. So it matches the sequence of other viruses, right? So this yellow, if I am exposed to another yellow piece of DNA, I have, a, I have a matching sequence. So I have these genes and these repeated sequences. They're not very long, and this actually is kind of a key to how this system works. You notice they're about 20 nucleotides long, and that's gonna come into play, I'm gonna talk about that here again in a later, because um, it has to do with statistics. Um, the longer the piece you come in, the more specific it would be, because it's, you know, it, it, if you, everything has an A, then an A and a T, it's, there's less likely, and then ATC, you know, the, statistically it becomes less likely to come across a, a longer pattern. So they incorporate this 20, about 20 nucleotides, and then this other little piece of DNA that they use over and over again, that black piece, that's about 30 nucleotides, so a total of 50 in this CRISPR array, okay? Um, You'll notice it says Cas1 and 2 there. Um, this is the Cas1 and 2 system. So bacteria have this gene, like those Cas genes make this particular protein. And it's pretty complex. It's got like lots of amino acids in it. It's a pretty big protein. But the distance between it actually determines, that's what I think is kind of elegant. It keeps cutting the exact same size of piece of DNA because of its length, the protein length of it. So it binds to viral DNA, this would be the virus, and it clips that little piece of DNA and adds it to its CRISPR sequence, okay? <clears throat> so DNA, according to our central dogma, becomes RNA, right? So DNA codes for RNA. So what the bacteria does is it turns this sequence now into little pieces of RNA, and this is called pre-CRISPR RNA, and you'll notice it has different colors, and it has that little hairpin sequence as well, okay? So what it does is it takes this off, a, a, an enzyme would come along and make this piece of RNA, okay? And then it would break it up into little pieces like this, so it expresses these. And then there'd be, need to be more of me, but I would hold these in my hand. So I'm ready for these viruses to come in. Into the, and so I'm gonna ask Tim to come up with a new one here. So if you think of this system now, I have this, I'm a, I'm a protein with this one, I'm a protein with this one, or I'm a protein with this one. It looks like he's coming in with some red here. So what I'm gonna do with this Cas9 system is I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna go, all right, this matches, right? I'm gonna look for that black line. It matches and I'm gonna cut it. What happens to the viral DNA when it's cut? 
doesn't work anymore. So now that virus is no good anymore. So I'm gonna bring the other one up. I have this Cas9 system with this piece of DNA. I come up, I look for this sequence, I match it up, and then I cut it. And now that virus is no good anymore. So I am just like a virus destroying machine as long as I've seen it already, right? So if I've seen it, I've incorporated it into my, my DNA, I make the RNA from it, and then I have this protein that when this virus inserts a piece of DNA, um, this is the Cas9 system, it recognizes it. This PAM sequence is that little mark that I'm gonna talk about. And I bind to it, I make sure that it matches, and then I cut it. And when you cut viral DNA, you make it so that it can't, it can't use the machinery and the bacteria to make more of itself anymore. So that's what all the CRISPR system is doing. It's taking, incorporating a short piece of DNA from a virus into its own genome, it's turning it into RNA, and turning it into a system that recognizes DNA and in foreign invading bodies, okay? So um, I keep talking, and you'll notice, this is actually an important thing. So when you leave, and you're, if you ever want to read about this before, you'll notice there's some limitations to this system is um, there always has to be this little black mark. And this is usually a three nucleotide sequence that um, me as a Cas enzyme has to recognize before I'll cut. Now this is actually pretty important because um, if you'll notice, and it doesn't matter the order of this. Um, this works so well in my mind. Um, <laughs> so if you look at this sequence here, um, let's put that one on. Oh, that's the problem. Hang on. We can edit this out. Um, if you think of this sequence here, um, the difference between it is this piece of viral DNA has that black line on it. My DNA inside the bacteria does not have that black line. And so you've heard of autoimmune diseases where your own immune system attacks, right, your own cells. With this little sequence, it's called the protospacer adjacent motif. And it's three nucleotides that the Cas gene, me, looks for before I'll cut. So I would go along my own DNA as a bacteria, and I'd go, oh my gosh, that sequence looks like what I want to cut. But it won't because it doesn't have that little PAM sequence, they call it, the protospacer adjacent motif. So you will see this if you read about the CRISPR system. Um, that's kind of a, a unique thing, and it ends up being a limitation because if you want to cut DNA later, you can only cut when you have a unique sequence, like any random DNA. Okay, so it's really a self-recognition tool um, for, for this system. By the way, finding pool noodle, noodles in February in, in Michigan, uh, <laughs> it's probably like trying to buy a sled in July. They're, I think they probably are in the same warehouse, um, especially when you want the same colors too. So, um, so they, they have to recognize that PAM sequence before they'll cut, okay? So back to, so that's virally, and back from a bacterial perspective, what happens? Bacteria clip out a little piece of DNA, save it. When they see something just like it, they cut it, okay? Where this system starts to get interesting is um, uh, in order for this Cas9 system, this protein to, to function, it needs CRISPR RNA. So it needs this, it needs a sequence that matches a virus or anything, this kind of random spacer that forms that loop. And then it also needs another piece of RNA that they don't really know exactly what it does, but they know that it helps prop up the protein, like it's a structural thing. And I'm going to show you an image of it here. This is an image I found um, from that Daugna lab um, where it's this Cas9 system. And what they're what Berkeley is, is famous for is they took and made this into one piece of, of RNA. So instead of needing this and another piece of RNA for this system to work, they linked them together and they made what's called a guide RNA. So when you think of it from an application of 
how are we going to modify some DNA? They call it a single guide or sgRNA, and it includes the piece that goes and recognizes the virus, and then this other piece that's a scaffold or a structural piece of RNA that seems to need to be there, okay? Because if you take it out, it won't work. So what scientists did uh, um, at Berkeley was they made this one piece of DNA, and they have a patent on that, um, that, that mechanism, okay? So I wanted to show you, I, I, the protein database is kind of a, a neat thing if you've ever done any DNA or RNA or protein um, research. Um, I found this on, the, um, on their website, and I, I just want to show it to you because it gets this, this protein three-dimensionally, and I was sort of amazed they had put some music to it, which I thought was, I don't know, I thought it was kind of interesting. So just enjoy looking at the Cas9. This is the Cas9 system which CRISPR, which we know is the array, and the Cas9 protein. Um, this is the system that goes and finds and cuts DNA, okay? So. This goes on for 30 more minutes, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, it's sort of an elegant system. It's got this protein, again, and you can see the different components to it. It's a pretty complex protein that binds to DNA, and you saw the pieces of DNA coming in. Um, it cuts it, okay, that's what renders the viruses inactive, and um, that's a big deal, because if you think about this, um, let me go to so what. Um, you have a device that in a bacteria, but you could pull it out and you could say, well, I have this tool that can recognize sequences of DNA. 20 base pairs is pretty unique, okay? Um, and it's a snipping tool, so it can recognize and cut DNA. So when people say the CRISPR-Cas9 system, that's what they're talking about. A piece of, well, a bacterial protein that can recognize with a piece of RNA in it that can recognize and cut other DNA, okay? So that's what we're talking about. And I like that from like Word 2000. Um, so what happens when you cut DNA? So why do we care about this? So when you cut DNA, a couple things can happen in, in eukaryotic cells. If you just cut it, um, it sort of scrambles. If there's, no, if there's nothing that it can match off of, what happens is it will, they call them indels, where they have insertions and deletions into the DNA. So if you have a gene that, let's say, it is coding for a protein that you don't want it to code for anymore, if you go in with a CRISPR-Cas9 system and cut it, it's going to screw up all those bases in that DNA, and it's going to make it so the protein doesn't exist anymore, the protein doesn't work anymore. But even more interesting is if you put in this Cas9 system to cut a piece of DNA and you have a piece of DNA that's correct, that, you, that has a difference in it, what it will do is it'll go through homologous directed repair and actually make a new piece of DNA that's right or correct. It's, so it's a way of correcting problems in the DNA, okay? And I'm gonna give you a couple examples of this. Um, if you've taken a biology class or a, you've learned about sickle cell anemia, okay? Sickle cell anemia, if you look over here, and I, this is why I started with RNA to DNA, this is, a per, this is a normal gene for DNA for someone without sickle cell anemia. And if you notice, it says GAG, okay? 
If you have sickle cell, you don't have GAG, you have GTG. Okay? It's a one base pair difference. Okay? So if I could design a CRISPR system that recognized an area around here and cut it, then I had a template that I put in with it, it would do exactly what this does. So it would cut it, it would find a new piece of DNA with a corrected base, okay, and it would fix it. Now I put in this slide, one of the things they've tried to do is heterozygous means you have one correct pair and one incorrect pair. So they have shown that in, in certain cells they can cut it and it will use the other correct allele, or a, excuse me, the correct piece of DNA. So we have two copies of DNA, right? Humans do. It cuts the bad one and it will use the corrected one to make it, to fix it in a sense. So it'll switch that T back to an A. And then, hopefully, the central dogma is DNA becomes RNA, becomes protein. Hopefully now that protein doesn't have that weird amino acid. It's not weird, it just doesn't have the same charge on it. And so you get those sickle cells and, you know, it's a, it's a horrible, horrible disease. So modifying DNA is, in a eukaryotic cell would be a big thing. If you can cut it, it would repair itself. Another example, and this, this has actually been done in what's called an organoid. Um, Tim and I have worked a little with um, a researcher over at MSU. He does some CRISPR research. And I visited his lab to, to see how he is doing this work. And they build, they take um, cells and they turn them into stem cells and grow little organs in a Petri dish, okay? And, and that's really neat. Um, but what they can do is, if you have cystic fibrosis, you will often, uh, one of the most common ways you have cystic fibrosis is you have a three base pair deletion in your DNA. So you're missing, I don't remember what it is, AAA, I think it is. Um, but if you're missing that, you could go in and cut that region, have a corrected piece, and it would fix that. Um, and it's just a teeny little deletion, but it makes a huge difference. If, if you know anybody that has CF, it's um, based on this um, uh, membrane protein that helps regulate water and chloride ions in and out of the cell, and they get thicker mucus, and it clogs the, those pores, and um, devastating disease. That could, if you could get a CRISPR system in to cut that DNA with the correct template, you, you, could, you could fix that. Um, this is another example that of non-human, but where they would have, uh, they have done this actually, they haven't released these, that I'm sure, can you imagine doing bug research, like if flying bug research, you know they're out, right? <laughs> like it would be, they, I just think that, that would be an interesting lab to visit, how they contain all the mosquitoes. Um, but what they do is they do gene modifications to make the females more, have more male characteristics. And so their sexual organs are deformed and their mouths are deformed. And these are specific m mosquitoes that only ca that carry malaria. And so if they release these out into the wild, right, I like this, I just like this image of, you know, mosquitoes deciding they're going to pass their genes along. Um, and uh, it's, it, they call it a gene drive where they have baby mosquitoes, and those baby mosquitoes all have these deformed components, and so they don't pass malaria. And that might not be a big deal to us because we don't um, live in a, with, with that many mosquito-borne illnesses, but in a country where there's a lot of malaria, um, this would matter, right? Um, there are two other types of systems that, that could potentially be used here. It's called CRISPR interference. So what they do is they take this Cas9 protein and um, remember it recognizes pieces of DNA. And they can take this and they can lay it on the DNA and then just have it adhere there. So they turn off the part of it that cuts the DNA. So all they do is use it as a recognition tool. And you can change the structure of it to make it bind more tightly. And it can go and it can interfere and basically stop genes from being expressed. So you don't go from DNA to RNA anymore because there's this stinking Cas9 protein bonded to it, okay? 
Um, so you can up, you can up regulate, you can down regulate genes, and then they can also upregulate genes where they use the same CRISPR system. They shut off the ability for it to cut, but they go and they bind to a specific region of DNA with other components on it. So they can modify the cast to attract things that will make the gene upregulate. So make more genes be be um, created, and they've done this. They've done this on, on some organisms, and they've done this on mice to increase the muscle mass. So they turn on the genes that make them build more and more muscle. So from a food distribution perspective, that might be beneficial, right? Your organisms create more meat, if that's the type of thing you're into, and um, you, know, you, you could uh, feed more people. Um, so why aren't we seeing this like everywhere? Um, I think that the, the main component, and I've, I've, read a lot, I've read a lot about this to how you get this into cells. So think about what you have to deliver. Me, a Cas protein, you have to deliver me. You wouldn't want to deliver a Cas piece of DNA because you don't want a bunch of me. Um, I'll keep cutting DNA. So you don't want me in there. So you want to deliver a protein and then that single guide piece of RNA, right? So those are the two things you need to recognize and cut DNA, and possibly a template, right, the correct version. So if I'm homozygous, I have a correct version, but if I'm not, I need to deliver all these things to cells to make this work. So they've thought about using viruses, human viruses, to deliver this, but you, those typically deliver DNA and RNA. Um, but there is sort of some promising work around these exosomes. And they're basically lipid protein, or excuse me, lipid membranes that in this little packet in the middle, they could put a protein, they could put a piece of RNA in there, and then it would kind of assemble when it made it to the cell. Easier said than done, though, because what happens? Our body mounts immune resist responses to these things. So. Um, it's tricky. I don't, I, when, you, when I think of this happening like, oh, this is going to solve cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia and all the other genetic diseases, the hardest thing is getting it to the cell. Okay? Um, I have read a couple promising things. If you can remove the cells and then put them back in, like that has some real promise. Because if you could, if you could take the cells out of a human and modify them and put them back in, that's a little easier. Um, but again, you don't want Cas9 in there constantly. It's just going to continue to cut DNA over and over again. Um, so I opened with that slide on that Chinese scientist that modified embryos. Um, that's pretty controversial, right? Like to, to modify a undeveloped, you know, organism. Uh, we, we probably all could have an argument about that, whether or not that should be done. Um, because you, we might say, well, all we're going to use this for is to get rid of CF and sickle cell anemia. But you might say, um, well, I want my offspring to have you know, big arms or you know, strong arms or whatever, whatever, blue eyes. Um, you, you might, um, that might get a little more complex. But you get that that's the best place to do it, right? Because you've got one cell you have to modify instead of, you know, I mean, I, I read, they use the analogy in this book, like, when do you edit the paper before it goes to print, right? You edit the paper before it goes to print, because once you, ha you if you modify one cell, um, that's fantastic. But once it is produced a baby, it is millions and billions of cells, so it's a little more difficult to do. So. Um, the, the differences between germline cells, egg and sperm, or somatic cells, skin, organs, it's a little less controversial because you don't have to, um, you know, you're not going to pass that on to offspring, but it's way more difficult. Um, the th there, there also is, if, you, if you're reading about this a little bit more, um, DNA repair can be pretty unpredictable. So it's beautiful that I show those two slides, like you get insertions and deletions, and you get a correction if you have a correct template. But it doesn't always work that way, OK? Um, that Chinese scientist, what he did was um, there is a protein that HIV will bind to on the cells, our immune cells. 
And, and you know, there's a certain pop amount of people in our population that are immune to HIV. You can be exposed to it, and they have a mutation on that protein in their membranes so the HIV virus can't bind to it. So what he did was he knocked out that P, modified that gene so that they have a modified protein. Now, that's problematic because that mutation happened probably millions of years ago. And we have other genes. We don't know a lot about that gene that HIV connects to. So if it modified just through the natural process of evolution, um, if, it, if it, other genes took its place, if it, it was of important, other genes actually compensate for it being mutated. And so when you just go in and blindly modify one protein and you don't know a lot about it, um, there could be other consequences for those chi children that were born that we don't know about, okay? So it is, it is pretty controversial for a reason, all right? Um, so kind of in conclusion, um, this is an adaptive bacterial si immune system. Bacteria are exposed to viruses, they clip out little pieces of DNA, and then they create a protein RNA system that can recognize and cut DNA, okay? Um, we know that DNA can re repair itself if there's a template, so cutting it, there's a chance that it could fix little mutations. I think a lot of the interesting research around binding without cutting is really important because we can upregulate genes and downregulate genes. Um, but right now, the biggest issue, I think, is delivering this to cells. And so that's why um, egg and sperm cells, pretty easy to access, but if we wanted to go in and modify my lung cells because I had CF, that might be a, a little trickier to do. So, so that is, I, I give you a little recommendation. If you want to read um, a pretty good book, Jennifer Daubna, again, at Berkeley, RNA um, chemist, biologist chemist, we're, we're all on the same team, right? Um, they, uh, uh, she has a, re a re kind of has, takes this really good perspective on this because she looks at the power of this and, and worries about it from an ethics standpoint. And, um, and I think she's trying to get in front of it and, uh, as, as a, a community, right? And just because we were to, if we were to pass laws or make regulations on this, it's a big deal if we do it in our country. Other countries could do it, right? And so science isn't limited. We don't limit science based on our our laws in, in one country, but um, she just wants to open the conversation. I think she does a nice job um, kind of outlining this process and then talking about what it could become, okay? Um, Tim mentioned, uh, well, actually, Taylor mentioned um, that uh, sometimes we think about this in terms of like, if we were to make a designer baby or something like that, um, only people with money would do, be able to do something like that. Where in turn, um, she makes the argument in her book that, that um, we might not, we maybe can't afford not to do this. Because if you could cure a disease or fix something before it becomes a problem, that might be cheaper in the long run. And so there are a lot of ethics around it, but it's kind of a fascinating topic and I appreciate Tim for letting me come and talk about it. And, um, I'll take any questions you have. So, yeah. <laughs> I think I got done. Yeah, that's good. Good timing. I have a microphone. All right. When I interviewed for my job 20 years ago, Tom <laughs> asked a pretty mean question. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, I'm going to show my ignorance here. Yeah. So when uh, when a bacteria reproduces, replicates, I don't know how bacteria do this. Yeah. Does it pass on its tip of its DNA that it's been changing all, all along here? Yeah. So isn't that getting like ungainly large after it keeps ah, getting? That's a good question. It's a good way to ask this. So interestingly, this is all over the place. There are like, there are dozens and dozens of CRISPR systems. Like there's type one, type two, type three. Some of them recognize RNA. Um, a typical bacteria only has, that's a pretty dynamic thing. So they might only have three to five CRISPR array. I mean, they might not have many incorporated viral DNA in their DNA. So they pass on what they have when they replicate their own DNA. 
But I also read that other organisms can have hundreds of spacers in there. Yeah, so yeah, but there are limits. So if you look at the, um, it depends on what they're being exposed to as well. So um, it actually runs the other way. You have the cast genes and they add in the middle. And the things that get further down, they sooner or later get clipped off because they're not being used as much. So it, it can turn it over. It's not like once it's in the CRISPR array, it's always there. So they do clip them out after a while. So that's a good question. <laughs> I like that one. I knew the answer. You redeemed yourself yeah, after 20 years. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, could I ask you to comment a little further on uh, like some of the ethical issues that uh, Jennifer Dwadna uh, brings up in the book? <coughs> I can give like a specific prompt. Oh, if go if ahead. Like. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, curious if um, like if there's any talk about like who should have the right to control uh, gene editing. Of course, because you'd ask like, do you want to hand it off to the government? Do you want uh, patented gene sequences? or gene editing tools, like uh, well, what is, does she have any commentary on this? She does, um, primarily what, she does talk a lot about access to it. Um, and again, from, it, it is more that, so at, initially she was, she was a little horrified by it um, because she thought of what, the, what could potentially come about from this technique. Um, but then she got, she got to this place where she thought, if we can do this, why don't we? Because it is sort of about um, easing human suffering. And so they, she, she comments mostly on that. Um, she doesn't get, obviously there's economic and different components to it, and she talks about that too. But um, it's primarily on um, basically costs. And she does, I mean, I think she's trying to get people to talk about this from the scientific community because it is tricky. Who does run it? Once people have patents on this, um, you know, they have a patent. And so, um, and I think that that's why she's kind of ha having the discussion. Because right now there are private companies that own these patents. So, I don't know if I answered your question. It's pretty big. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question pertaining to cancer. Do you, did you, in your readings, did you come across any researchers who are trying to insert the sequence that will allow cancer cells to remember that they need to go into apoptosis? Yeah, um, they, they have a lot of hopes with cancer cells. In fact, um, uh, over at Michigan State, that's one of the interesting things is there's a common mutation in cancer cells. It's, it's a, a gene, it's a tumor suppressor gene that gets mutated. And apparently the cell type that can, you can do CRISPR in matters whether it's a cancer or non-cancer cell. It's easier to do them, do it when they're cancer cells or when they have a particular mutation, um, which makes some sense. But absolutely, those are the things that if you can sequence it, and find out where the errors are, um, those are absolute, absolutely techniques that they could use. Turn, like, turn on that process again, because something has been mutated that it's not getting that signal to destroy itself. Yeah, for sure. So um, I know you brought up autoimmune diseases at the beginning of the talk, but I just wanted to ask you to expand on that a little bit. Um, what are the... Uh, the hope, what's the hope with CRISPR technology in um, the treatment of autoimmune diseases? And is there actually any um, scientific evidence that that could come about? Yeah, that I actually don't know. I will tell you, I was making the analogy that um, the reason they have this little, the, like the cast proteins actually recognize this little piece right here so that they don't go and cut their own DNA up. So they don't do have, the, the bacteria don't really have, in a sense, an autoimmune disease where they'll cut, because the bacteria has no interest in cutting itself up. So it has a mechanism where the piece it nicks out of a virus, it has to be next to a specific sequence. And the most common one is N, which is, means any amino acid, 
or excuse me, any nucleic acid, GG. And so it'll search along here, see AGG, and then clip out this piece to incorporate into its DNA. But it doesn't put NGG into its DNA because it would go and cut itself then. And so it was more of a, I, cert, I haven't read much about autoimmune diseases in CRISPR though. Um, I mean, autoimmune diseases are such, are typically where you have a component that's self-recognizing. So I guess you, could you go and cleave out that section of, of your, in your immune system? Boy, potentially, but I, I, sorry, I don't know that much about it, so. Sounds like you have a project now. <laughs> Other questions? Oh. Um, I was wondering, it's kind of a two-parter, is uh, CRISPR interference preferred in any way over using like a SI RNA or micro RNAs, or is that like a quality check step before proceeding on, like seeing a down regulation in the protein before actually trying to modify it? Yeah, I think um, it's pretty specific. I know like RNA interference is, I would think that this would could have a higher affinity for a piece of DNA, because you know that any, any bacteria, or excuse me, any protein, if you do, you can do kinetic studies on it where you modify it and see how strongly it bonds to a segment of DNA. So I would guess that CRISPR would give you kind of a control that just throwing another piece of RNA in it to interfere wouldn't provide, right? So I would think that this would be a preferred mechanism, but I know there are, um, there are definitely therapeutic treatments where they just are putting RNA to interfere with proteins being created. So I would think this would be preferred. So does that answer your question? Was there another part of it? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? No, oh, Dana. Do you know if there's been any research in using CRISPR to develop vaccines or anything like that as far as altering the immune system to be preventative and seeking out certain viruses that we can't right now? I don't. I, I will say that um, I did read a few articles where um, viruses will put latent bacteria in our bodies, right? They will, they will insert, and what they have done is with CRISPR you can identify really low concentrations of things. So I know from a diagnostic standpoint, that's where I think the, a lot of this future is, is in diagnostics. So like if you had a, a virus still in your system but you weren't showing any symptoms, could you actually go and clip that out or identify that it's even still there? But in terms, of the immune system is pretty complex. <laughs> I don't, I'm not an immunologist, so, nor do I want to give a talk on it next year, Tim. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, anything else? Oh, Bob, yeah. So, B Bill, there's a lot of controversy about where this should or shouldn't be used. Where do you think, or where do scientists in general think, are the least controversial uses for CRISPR? Where will we see this come along first? Yeah, I, um, so some of that work that I read on with exosomes is I do think that, um, so, so cells apparently put out, they communicate with these, these components that have, will have proteins and DNA in them. Um, I would think that they could target specific organs or disease using this system as opposed to like, which wouldn't be that controversial, right? Um, I think what I, I will tell you, the more I l read about this, the more I see it as a diagnostic tool as opposed to a tool that's going to go in and modify people's DNA, um, unless it's on germline cells, truthfully. And it's because it's pretty unpredictable where the, this Cas protein will, one, how long it'll stay in a system, and when as long as it's there, it's cutting DNA. And they get off-site cuts. Um, it's not as specific as it's, it's being touted as. So um, I think that, I mean, if you had, if you, it's like any, um, any drug, I think that um, if, you were, if you were desperate, you would try it, right? So I mean, um, but I, I, I don't, 
I think that you, where you do see issues and people don't like to see are germline modifications that result in specific traits. But using it for disease, I think those are the types of things you'll see. So, but. Hmm. All right. Maybe one more question if there's any. There might be cookies left. Oh. <laughs> Jacob. Yeah. So. Because CRISPR keeps on cutting DNA, as you've said, uh, because it's not exactly well regulated at the moment, if it keeps on cutting DNA in areas that don't want it to, couldn't that be a limitation of it where it would cause its own kind of diseases? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that they're doing, though, is um, though that, that beautiful video with it kind of looping around is there some of those domains in the cast protein, they're modifying so they um, don't recognize the DNA as well. So they can lower the affinity that that Cas9 system has for a particular segment so of DNA. So it'll periodically find its target and cut. But if they lower the affinity, they, the, the offsite cuts don't, it's sort of a give and take, right? You lower the affinity for the cutting, you don't cut as often, but you don't hit your target as often either. And so I think a lot of the research is going to be around modifying that so it doesn't hit as much. Because what you don't want is to fix one problem and create another problem. So, it, but it, that's real. So, all right. Oh. I lied. Yeah. <laughs> Can Cas9 bind um, regions of DNA that are methylated more so than regions that are not? Oh, I, I don't know about that. I know where you're going with that, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think I have read that they will cut out areas of methylation so that they don't have the effects of, of what that might do, like turning a gene on or turning a gene off. But, um, you can get CAS systems that recognize specific methylated areas, though. So they're working on that. I just don't know that much about it. So. All right. I had a quick question. Oh, yeah. Um, when they do, uh, you were saying that it's easier to use probably when you take the cells out of the patient and modify them. Is that what they're currently doing with uh, immunotherapy? Are they using the CAS9 to do that? And, and how come? Why would that be easier to get that in those cells? Well, I think it's because they don't have to deliver it through your system, like inject it into your blood. or um, So they have it in a particular container that they can, because you can change the solvents around cells and make them take things up easier, because you can put more extreme conditions on a cell in a test tube than you can in your body, because you have to, you have to live. And so, um, so you don't want to do too many extreme things in a biological system. But if they can pull the cells out and then put them back in, like bone marrow and things like that, I, I have seen that, that they're doing some success. But I don't know if they're doing it in humans yet. So, but you see mouse models and things like that where they are. So, yeah. All right. Well, Thanks we for respect coming. everybody's time. And we... Yeah. Uh, Let's give uh, Professor Faber another round of applause. Right.